We have a session put together with three speakers. Um, the first is Dr. Brendan Visser, who will speak about surgical oncology and nets. He's a um, friend and colleague at Stanford. He's a hepatobiliary and pancreas surgeon. And, um, and then following him will be Dr. Arthur Sung, who will speak about interventional pulmono pulmonology. And then Emily Bergsland, if she makes it back from her flight, um, will be here hopefully around 2.40. And if not, we'll, we'll add her towards the end when she makes it back from her flight. So I'll let, hand this over to Brendan. And you can either advance here, and there are, there's a pointer here, there's this is a pointer, so, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to be here. I, I was here a couple of years ago, and I'm impressed at the, at, the, um, at the numbers today, and I'm excited to see a number of people I've operated on. Um, so I actually think I have kind of a hard job, to be honest. Uh, um, Pam gave me this title, Surgical Advance Advances in Neuroendocrine Tumor Treatment. So the, the question is, are we advancing? Um, an operating theater looks a lot like the operating room today. Um, you know, surgical instruments look remarkably like surgical instruments, uh, you know, from the Civil War era on. So uh, it's a little hard, in fact, to talk about surgery for net broadly and talk about advances. So I uh, did just what we were talking about a few minutes ago. I started with PubMed, but then I got desperate and actually went to Google myself. So, um, you know, I tried to see if they had .edu. I do use the same criteria to try to be good. Um, but when I searched for surgical advances in, in net treatment, in fact, many of the articles were about medical advances. So um, I have to give it to my colleagues for having made some more technological progress than we have. Um, and there's a lot of, obviously, novel interventional techniques as well. But in the first paragraph of every article, and then again in the last paragraph, thankfully for me and my job security, surgical resection still remains the cornerstone and, and is talked about as the only curative therapy. So uh, despite the fact that our progress in some ways isn't as dramatic, uh, we are still relevant. So um, a couple of things that I'm leaving out of this talk. Uh, this is the first. So Dr. Coons told me no gory pictures, so this is blurred out. But in fact, for a surgeon to give talks without pictures uh, is unusual and difficult for us because, you know, it's a craft. So if you were a cabinet maker and you couldn't show pictures of cabinets, it would be very hard to talk about cabinets. Um, I also chose to leave out these sort of things. Uh, surgeons like to put these because the surgical line looks better. Uh, but these graphs obviously can hide a lot. This is actually NASDAQ. We can confuse the heck out of you with these uh, and use them to whatever ends we like, more or less. So, neuroendocrine tumors, I think this crowd knows as well as any, uh, or perhaps better than any other, that these are a very heterogeneous group of tumors um, in terms of their presentation. Some of you uh, have experienced these hormone symptoms that are such a hallmark, and some don't have any symptoms until the darn thing uh, is quite sizable. And this is a big pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in the tail here, and it had liver meds at the time of presentation. And then here's a little baby in solenoma. And these are uh, the same disease, but very different diseases. Uh, and so the surgical treatments, of course, then are across the spectrum in the same way. So a few generalizations that I think are worth talking about or bringing up again. Usually, in almost all cases, for localized disease, surgery is still warranted. Uh, and and, and you know, there are rare exceptions to that, but surgery for patients with localized disease is often curative, uh, and, and uh, so it's warranted even sometimes if that's very aggressive surgery when it remains localized disease. I would also say it's useful to sort of keep in mind as I, as I talk for the next few minutes that resection of metastases, uh, if it is complete, or in some cases even if it's nearly complete, is also often warranted to try to prolong uh, survival. Uh, resection of metastases can be curative, but more often it is the most definitive way to kick that can down the road. And it's the strategy that kicks the can down the road the furthest at present. Another one that's a little bit trickier still, uh, resection of the primary, even in the set of in a metastatic disease that is unresectable, can still be warranted. And that is in some patients, like the one here, this is a patient with a carcinoid in, this, in the terminal ileum, a, a, tr a true carcinoid in the, in the most traditional sense tumor, uh, who had liver metastases, but you can see that this small bowel uh, 
here is very dilated because this little carcinoid tumor was causing chronic obstruction. So even in the setting of metastatic disease that was not resectable, that's an obvious indication for a surgery. And I'll also touch on this a little bit uh, later, that sometimes we are now using resection of the primary even in the setting of metastatic disease if we have other ways to treat the metastatic disease that we might not have for the primary. The most obvious example is uh, liver metastases where we have a number of other treatment options. But irrespective of all these different sort of surgical principles, we, the thing that drives outcomes still remains largely tumor biology. So a lot of this and a lot of the surgical decision making ends up coming back to the biology of the disease, the, the KI-67 rate, the degree of differentiation, those elements that determine the pace of that uh, specific patient's disease. And I think, so surgery for, for neuroendocrine tumors has a lot to do with what the scan looks like, but it also has a lot to do with what the, the, the histologic slides look like. So what are we doing better if, if surgery looks a lot like surgery did once upon a time? So surgery is getting more invasive and less invasive. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. Um, and despite doing more surgery, uh, it's getting safer, I think, progressively at places that do it. And then I, I'll touch on that we're trying to customize our, pro our approach and, and customize our sequence. And, and many of you have undoubtedly experienced that as we wrestle with the best strategy for an individual patient. So less invasive. Minimally invasive surgery is a term you guys may have well have heard, and it, it includes laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery. Robotic surgery is just basically a fancier version of laparoscopic surgery with a very expensive tool, but it's a tool that uh, remains a very useful tool for some cases, uh, but it is just a tool. It doesn't, isn't fundamentally different. Um, it has a lot to do, we are getting better instrumentation so we can do more uh, all the time using minimal invasive tools. And, and frankly, in addition to getting better tools, we are getting better as surgeons, so surgeons can do more in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, one of my residents some years ago called it keyhole chopstick surgery, and I think that is a, is a reasonable description. And, and the benefits of minimally invasive surger, surgery are obvious. Uh, most of them are short-term benefits related to a patient's recovery, pain, use of pain medicines, time in the hospital, wound complications. There are probably some benefits in terms of immunologic uh, suppression that, that operations actually uh, are responsible for. But overall, minimally invasive surgery means a faster return to work, life, et cetera. And sometimes a faster return or moving on towards adjuvant therapies, meaning post-operative therapies, which is, is, is another important um, utility of that. At the end of the day, though, it really is about this. These two patients had the same operation, and one is the traditional incision, uh, and the other is the, or the laparoscopic version. And so you can imagine how different the trajectory is following surgery. So laparoscopic uh, operations now would include such simple things as bowel resections, for example, for some uh, terminal ileal carcinoid tumors. It includes a nucleation of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, Left-sided or distal pancreatectomies, I think, for uh, many, many tumors uh, are, are done uh, minimally invasively, and, and, and for those, for modest-sized tumors, it's probably the standard of care at academic centers to re resect it laparoscopically. Uh, many liver resections, even large anatomic liver resections, can be done laparoscopically. Uh, and in fact, a subset of patients who undergo this sort of infamous operation called the Whipple operation, now we do laparoscopically. Uh, so continuously pushing uh, forward in that regard, uh, and a greater percentage of these cases can be done that way. So then, what did I mean by more invasive? We're getting more invasive at the same time on the other end of the spectrum. So uh, again, as, as this crowd knows better than any, many patients can advance, present with very advanced disease, especially for, for non-functional tumors because they just uh, have no symptoms until the disease is, uh, is quite bulky. So. In fact, even at present, many patients are not considered candidates for surgery when they first see a physician or a surgeon uh, because of the extent of their disease. Um, and uh, that has a lot, however, to do with where they go uh, and who they see and what is now feasible. And I think it's important, and I, I think this crowd in particular, uh, in seeking this kind of information, you're the, the ones who are educated and, and have educated yourselves and have sought all the information you can, but unfortunately I think there's a number of patients or a very significant chunk of patients out there 
who don't necessarily see the right physicians and surgeons at the right uh, high volume center to know if they're a candidate for surgery or not. So, because at high volume centers, and that's places like UCSF and Stanford, and, and in fact, uh, you know, even um, non-academic high volume centers, there's a lot that can be done that wasn't done even a decade ago. Uh, and, and since we saw you, many of you raised your hands for how many years you have been battling this disease, a decade ago and this disease is a really long time ago. Uh, it's a really long time ago in what we've been able to accomplish in terms of developments. And, but it's a disease where patients can do so well that in, in, in your individual disease courses, we're going to continue to make progress. Uh, I'm very hopeful. So this in includes very extended liver resections, and I'll show you what that means with a picture of x-rays, not surgical specimens, uh, shortly. Two-stage liver resections. So sometimes patients have such bulky disease that we can't take it out at a single operation, but because the liver is this remarkable organ that grows back, we can whittle a little off of one side, let it regrow, and then whittle a little off of the other side to take very extensive disease out of the liver in two operations. Uh, and uh, where otherwise it wouldn't have been feasible in the past because you would have left so little liver behind that it wouldn't have been enough to get over the hump otherwise. Big multivisceral resections for very extensive tumors uh, are feasible and feasibly done safely, which is quite important because obviously when one is assessing that risk-benefit ratio, it really has to be safe, uh, and that's so critical. Uh, we have demonstrated uh, that resection of, of the tumors that involve major vasculature that a short time ago surgeons wouldn't have considered is really feasible and, and now done with good safety and, and is associated with good outcomes in the long term, not just the short term, in terms of controlling people's disease in the long run. So I think there's really good evidence that aggressive surgery, when it can be done safely, is warranted because it can really extend long-term survival and disease control. And these are just a couple of pictures of what these tumors look like. This is a patient with very bulky tumors and requires the great bulk of the liver removed, leaving a little triangle of liver here that's the uninvolved. And that can done, be done very safely and very reliably uh, at, at academic centers. This is another patient who um, I operated on about five years ago and was first in New Mexico and declared not a candidate for surgery. This is the pancreatic primary, uh, and this pancreatic primary is growing into the por SMV and portal vein here, going up to the liver. So they were seen in a big hospital in New Mexico, considered unresectable, went to Dallas, and Dallas said, we don't, can't do it, but you probably could go across to California because we think we know somebody who would. And this patient is doing just great and is alive and well with this tumor out, living totally normally. And so, you know, they had to hop, skip, and jump around. But when they, one finds the right center uh, with the right experience, this is, proves very feasible. I should also note that I think one thing that uh, we're doing better is understanding the disease and making better surgical decisions, not just about what is feasible to do surgically, but what makes sense in the context of somebody's disease. So as an example, it doesn't project very well. Uh, just in terms of how we try to mesh and understand the disease with the operation we plan, this is a patient here, and this is an, an MRI with EOVIST, and every one of these little red arrows represents a site of a metastatic tumor from a carcinoid. And there are different ways that one can tackle these, uh, but I think with uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine mets, at, at centers with a lot of experience now, you work hard to take out those spots by resection and ablation, but leave the liver behind as much as is humanly possible to leave liver behind for a rainy day. Because it turns out when we do the great walloping liver resections where we take out big chunks of liver, well, we leave a healthy liver behind if, the, if slash when the disease comes back, we have fewer other treatment options because there's fewer little pieces of the liver puzzle, of that little jigsaw puzzle that is the liver to work with in the future. So now at centers and surgeons who have a lot of experience with this, you strategize specifically for an individual patient's disease process to try to anticipate, well, what's going to be next in their treatment course after my first operation? Uh, what if it comes back? What medical therapies, what interventional therapies, and what further operations would be useful, and how can I plan for that possibility now accordingly? I then also touched upon the fact that uh, we sometimes now are resecting primaries even in the setting of bulky metastatic disease. 
Obviously, metastases are often multifocal at presentation in this disease, for, especially for those with non-functional tumors. And one of the very common sites of disease, of course, is the liver. Uh, and one of the great developments that others beyond the surgeons have made is all the other different liver-directed therapies now that are available to us in terms of arterial therapies, we're delivering chemotherapy or radiation uh, into the liver or ablation of liver. So as a result now, because we have a lot of tools against liver-specific disease, there are many cases where we'll take out the primary elsewhere because that leaves only the liver disease behind. And if it's only liver disease, we have a lot of tools against that. And those may be systemic therapies, but they may be those liver-directed therapies. And in isolated cases, that can be even a liver transplant. So again, an example where in the past, we didn't really contemplate such aggressive surgery, but now, especially in the sequencing of different people's, uh, of different individual patients' treatments, it can make sense. So again, even without showing those sort of bar graphs and, and line graphs, uh, I think it's quite clear that we do this progressively more safely at high volume centers. So these big operations that were considered life-threatening in the past, we do now with very good safety profiles. And obviously there is a risk to it, but it's been minimized at high volume centers. Uh, and, uh, and despite doing bigger operations, the morbidity and mortality is dropping down. And despite doing operations on more patients and being more inclusive of patients who are sicker, older, younger, different, uh, we still are being able to keep a very uh, low rate of morbidity and mortality despite these great big operations. And so that, of course, is quite critical. And then customizing the approach. And, and this is so critical uh, and I think it can't be overemphasized. This is a heterogeneous disease at presentation, as you all know, and perhaps more so almost than any other disease I treat, this is a very variable one. And it has this unpredictable and very long clinical trajectory. Uh, and we call it indolent. And that, that word is a double-edged sword. It, it sounds good to call it indolent, but I think probably those of you in the room living with it to be told you have an indolent cancer is, it sounds a little hollow other times because it still nonetheless is obviously very often progressive and, and so often recurrent. We have these great tools against this disease now, right? A biologic agents and chemotherapy and interventional radiology therapies and, and the scalpel being one of those. But we have to really balance the efficacy of each one of these with the morbidity of them and then sequence them. And for, for different individuals, the sequence can be quite different uh, to try to customize for the location of the tumor, the, the, de the degree of differentiation of a tumor, the patient's symptoms or lack thereof, and how to strategize to put these in order and use each of our tools one at a time. And I think there's really no disease where a team approach then is more critical because of the complexity of playing this for the long game, not the short game. And, and you know, as a surgeon, it's like a barber, right? You come to the surgeon, you expect a haircut, and sometimes the haircut is definitely the right things, but other times the right thing is to defer and save that trick up your sleeve for a, another day. And I think it's so critical that you have a, a team of colleagues that you can go and, and strategize with. Uh, and, and, and this is true of many, many of our patients, and it's really one of the reasons why I feel so lucky to work with the colleagues here. This is a man who presented with very bulky disease, for example. This is a liver full of tumor growing into his cava. He ultimately went, underwent chemotherapy first, shrinking his disease, and went on to resection later, uh, because he otherwise would have been deemed never a candidate for surgery. So it's so critical that you f strategize that way about how much chemotherapy, what next, if this one doesn't work, what are we gonna go to? One thing that I think will be a great challenge, though, as we get these uh, huge variety of treatments, and uh, you know, a few moments ago we were talking about how to, to find and then judge the information that is available to you. This is gonna be really hard and perhaps getting harder, uh, just as a side note, because as we individualize treatments, because we have so many tools, for an individual, we are going to be comparing many different things used in a different sequence, in different dosages, in different timing, because our experience tells us that may be the best path for that patient. But that means no two patients' treatment course will look the same. And when you try to then compare the literature, comparing surgery versus XY or radioembolization versus ablation versus surgery, it will get muddier, not clearer, I fear, but, which is a good side effect 
uh, of all the variety of treatments we have. So then, finally, surgery for endocrine tumors. I think we're getting less invasive for some. We're getting more radical for others. Uh, I think, though, that's based on really growing, progressive understanding of the disease that surgeons can do a better job accordingly. Uh, and I think we have to do this better strategizing with all the non-surgical therapies. And there's perhaps no more di important disease in terms of surgeons understanding the non-surgical options than this one. Uh, but arguably, thankfully for me and my uh, job security, surgery is still, you know, the, the, a quite powerful tool against this disease. Thanks so much, Brendan. Maybe time for one or two questions as we're getting, I'll try to get the slides up for Dr. Sung. Sure. I think that, that's a great question. I don't think we totally know uh, about the, there's a lot of sort of underlying cancer biology questions in there though. Um, but as a rule, in, in those patients with occult primaries and who have a disease elsewhere that is not surgically resectable, we wouldn't necessarily chase the primary uh, So uh, as a rule. Because if, if so, so to speak, the, the horse is out of the barn going to, and, and the horse is permanently and, you know, and, and out of the barn, and can't, that can't be dealt with in a surgical fashion, um, and we can't find the primary as a rule, we don't go hunting for it. Um, though obviously that, it's a little bit of a complex question actually. Does that lower the incidence of uh, more metastasis? Does that stop it? <laughs> uh, no, I think not. I think not, as a rule. Uh, and, and patients with metastases in general then would be on some other therapy which would be controlling the disease systemically and then systemic control of the disease would be the priority there. Uh, surgery obviously has downsides. It's an interruption of systemic therapy. Uh, it ha in, in, even in addition to the acute pain, suffering, morbidity of surgery. So, as a rule, no. Sure. How do you get reliable statistics on the uh, mortality or morbidity by institution and by surgeon? So, that's a good question. The question was around how do we get reliable statistics on the sort of, I guess, volume, morbidity, mortality at a particular institution? I'll, I'm, I'm going to defer that to Dr. Wow. Visser. Um, I, you know, I, believe it or not, I don't know that you can. Um, Ask for, your surgeon how many procedures they've done? The, the, yes, so I think you have to chase it, and you do have to, I think it starts with going to higher volume hospitals, and then finding a surgeon, and then asking them very bluntly. You know, there are some spe surgical specialties that have really put this information out there, like cardiac surgery, um, and, and, you know, surgical oncology and hepatobiliary surgery, there's some talk in the future that those statistics, how many cases are even done, as simple as that would be available publicly, but they're not. So I think it really relies on surgeons and advocates to ask those blunt questions to try to find the experienced surgeons. Uh, but it's a real challenge, I have to admit. I mean, when I have loved ones who need a doctor, I, I struggle, and it's just by doing a lot of asking around, basically, and then asking blunt questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for the foundation, as well as Dr. Kunz, Dr. Fisher, for inviting me and to think out of this, outside the box this year to think about the diaphragm this year. So b to be a pulmonologist in this setting of this fantastic uh, medical oncologist, mostly dealing with the GI oncology issue, as well as a surgical oncologist, it's a little intimidating and with the audience very sophisticated. So anyways, what I'm going to try to do is to give you a broad-based overview of what we as pulmonologists do to, when we encounter uh, bronchial calcinoid. Why we, me as an interventional pulmonologist, what that means is that we use a lot of minimally invasive approach uh, in trying to diagnose an abnormality that was revealed on a CAT scan, such as a lung mass. But although that, that's the most common thing that we deal with, bronchial carcinoid or carcinoid tumor that arises 
primarily from the lung, is still something we do see occasionally. I would have to say statistically about one to 2% of our practice. So it's something that we certainly work very closely with our colleagues with thoracic oncology and most importantly, thoracic surgeon. Listening to Dr. Fisser's uh, lecture with the chopsticks approach, why I, ex I, why I sort of consider myself an expert in chopsticks, <laughs> but there's no way what I can achieve with a bronchoscope that a surgeon will do. So what I hope to do is to give you somewhat an overview. So this is back in my year in Boston, and scarily, that's almost a decade ago, after my fellowship here. We basically had a uh, young woman, in fact a lawyer from Boston running across a along the Charles River every day, and she progressively had more and more shortness of breath symptoms. And of course, you know, one thing led to another, uh, a CAT scan demonstrated that within the windpipe of the trachea itself, there is a um, luminal mass that's obstructing it. And also having instruction of Dr. Kunz not to give you any real life picture of a bronchoscope, I'm gonna give you a cartoon. Uh, but this is actually a virtual CT uh, tomography of what the scan is reconstructed by our thoracic radiologist that you see if we were to look down with a camera nowadays with a very nice digital chip, high definition, you see almost a very smooth sheen-like uh, mass that can emanate from the lung or the airway itself. Well, that unfortunately, Carcinoid syndrome is a very uncommon characteristic of lung uh, carcinoid tumor that's derived from the lung, so it's a very safe procedure to biopsy the tumor from the lung itself. So in this case, this young lady turned out to have typical carcinoid, and during our bronchoscopic feature, in addition to taking a biopsy and having the pathologist look at what it is eventually, we basically look at all the margins of the tumor, does it go down to what level of the airway, and whether that, that is a surgically resectable tumor. And it turns out that it was. So this patient had a curative intent surgery, and that is still the theme of the talk. No matter where, how you speak of lung cancer, whether that is the more traditional smokers or non-smoker-related lung cancer, and carcinoid, uh, bronchial carcinoid, surgery still affords a curative intent. Just a little bit of the basic background of bronchial carcinoid. Again, as I said, it does comprise a lot less frequency for what we encounter when we think about lung cancer. It's rather uncommon, and it's also indolent, meaning that it's usually biologically slower in terms of evolution or progression. However, within the carcinoid group, and I'm excluding small cell lung cancer, uh, but more of the carcinoid type, uh, it is almost to a third of all carcinoid tumors does generate or comes out from the lung itself. The incidence is quite low. There is a little bit higher incidence in female versus male, and about in the less than one to up to two per 100,000 population per year. Although that smoking is not felt to have a direct causative mechanism, up to two thirds of the patients had had a history of smoking in the past. So I'm not gonna belabor the points, but um, it is similar in terms of pathology uh, versus the, uh, as compared to GI tumors. Um, the lungs is, other than the GI tract, the lung is actually the second most common site of, uh, of uh, uh, the organ involvement. Um, again, the presentation itself is rather nonspecific. In this example, it is a rather nonspecific shortness of breath on exertion symptoms. But because the tumor, a lot of the times, is quite vascular, meaning that there's a lot of blood vessel within, sometimes you do see what's called hemoptysis of coughing or blood being a not uncommon presentation. It happens in a, a more, for us, a, a younger gen, uh, population of patients in the mid 40s. Uh, most of the time, and that's why bronchoscopy or a flexible camera via the windpipe under a 
twilight procedure or general, general anesthesia procedure, it derives mostly from the more central area, such as the windpipe or the first branch or two branches of the windpipe, like the branches of a tree. Um, and again, coughing, wheezing symptoms, coughing of blood, discomfort uh, of the uh, respiratory symptoms are the most common type. This is more the schematics. Um, this is actually, I use the same slide for the lung cancer patients. Uh, the different types of how uh, we recognize tumor in the lung can be a tumor that's purely within the airway. Unlike uncommon in carcinoid, a tumor that's purely compressing beyond the windpipe, but not invading through the airway itself, or actually a combination of both, which is more common, common in carcinoid. This is sometimes what we call an iceberg tumor, where bronchoscopically, meaning that with a camera, you see part of the tumor, but in actuality, the tumor actually extends be, below the airway itself. However, again, because of the indolent or the slow growing feature of this tumor, the thoracic surgeon has many ways that they can still resect the tumor even if it's called the so-called the iceberg symptom, iceberg feature. And I'll show you in a few slides later. Uh, chest X-ray is uh, mostly, a lot of the times you see a very sharp border um, mass that can be a rise in the central region. And on a CAT scan, which is probably the best um, modality to look at the tumor itself, it can also show a very well-defined or ovoid-looking uh, mass on the chest X-ray. This is a chest X-ray that's uh, from the front and from the side. As you can see, the more central area, you can see that there's a rounded, ovoid, very sharp border opacity in this region. So how do we diagnose it? Well, we diagnose it by doing, in the 21st century, a bronchoscopy. But bronchoscopy has been done many years ago, even more than a century ago. This is the old way of doing things. This is done in, um, uh, amazingly, it was actually a metal tube that um, a surgeon put in through the patient sitting up without gen anesthesia. And uh, the first case was actually retrieving a chicken bone from a airway itself. But nowadays, we certainly have evolved. So maybe a little bit more of a new advances, but. Um, but uh, Dr. Aikida in the 1960s actually invented the flexible bronchoscope. And that's really revolutionized how we do biopsy itself. Uh, the flexible bronchoscope, as the name implies, is that the patient can now undergo a trilight procedure, meaning that conscious sedation, where they sleep for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we can fit in a bronchoscope via either the nose or the mouth, advancing through the trachea and beyond, and have a visualization for fiber optics. This is a picture from the 1960s. Certainly, we've evolved much better now. Nowadays, it's a digital, digital chip camera that we can have a high definition and have very good image capture. And the tools itself also has allowed us to have a lot more leeway in terms of getting a lot better substance of biopsy and also be able to do what's called coagulation, stop any blood vessels from bleeding. So we, we are equipped in terms of doing a lot of that. Bronchial carcinoid, although not in a traditional term, it's the same as your bronchogenic lung cancer, but in terms of how we approach it, it's the same. The most powerful thing how we stratify management and to prognosticate patient is still about staging. And in the lung, staging is king in terms of just like GI, it's what lymph nodes around the airway is involved with tumor. You don't have to recognize this, uh, memorize this, but this is the windpipe. But along the windpipe, we all have many lymph nodes that normally live there. Lymph node, as you know, resides are the immune cells, but that's also where some of the cancer cells can travel and spread. So it is utmost important when you are faced with carcinoid tumor or any lung cancer that you do a very complete staging. And staging, all it means is about getting to those lymph nodes and getting a good biopsy sample for the pathologist to look at to see whether there's involvement or not. So what we have 
probably one of the biggest advance for the last 50 years for what we have is the endobronchial ultrasound. The gastroenterologist has similar things that they can actually use a endoscope, just like going into the GI tract, esophagus, and what's equipped at the tip of the camera is to actually miniaturize ultrasound. We can look across the airway. Gastroenterologists can go down esophagus and go down to the pancreas. They can look at lymph nodes around those areas to see if there's lymph node that needs to be sampled. Uh, we usually lag behind gastroenterologists by about five, seven years because the size does matter. It does take time to miniaturize all the technologies. So this is one picture of a uh, schematic of how we biopsy the lymph nodes. The ultrasound is also equipped with what's called DARPA signal to avoid blood vasculature. This is what we see. It takes some training to look at and differentiate what's lung tissue and what's lymph nodes. In this example, this picture shows us that a needle is actually passing within the lymph node and we're acquiring the sample under real time. Having said that, again, staging is all about whether the patient is going to get surgery or not. Surgery is the center of care, it is a curative intent. However, um, and I'm very fortunate to work with a fantastic thoracic surgeon at Stanford, Mark Berry, which, who, who we recruited from Duke University a few months ago. So no, and these are slides that's provided from Dr. Berry. Uh, none of the slides will have any gory details. In the old days, that surgery is done by thoracotomy, where there's a very large incision, there's actually um, even resection of the rib in terms of taking out big portions of the lung. With the advancement, uh, there's what's called video-assisted thoracoscopy, where cameras are now used, like laparoscopically, where Dr. Fizzer does, that you can use small portal entry and using a triangulation approach where you have different areas into the side of the chest that they can insert cameras and be able to approach different aspects of the lung. So nowadays, having small incisions, you can actually have a very good resection and have a short length of stay in terms of hospitalization. These are the levels of resection. I'm gonna go from the um, the smallest one to the largest one, quote unquote. The cleanest surgery is always under a, an anatomical resection, meaning that the right lung is divided into three lobes, the upper, the middle, and the lower. But the left lung is divided into upper and lower. And these are separated by what we call the fissures or the lines that are separating the lung, the upper, middle, and the lower. The cleanest resection for us is basically taking about one lobe as divided by the fissure itself. So the smallest type of surgery is actually called a, called a wedge resection, where a surgeon can take out a partial or subanatomical resection. Why this is a good surgery, especially for patients who are smokers, who have emphysema, it is done, but it is not the most desirable. We do want the cleanest one, which is an anatomical resection taking out one lobe, which is indicated in this case, where a lobe can be incised via the, for example, in this case, a right upper lobe bronchus taking out this lobe itself, and the lobe is now along the fissure, and that's a clean resection. Um, on the contrary, a pneumonectomy, if a tumor comes from a very central area involving the upper and the lower lobe, and that might require a pneumonectomy, meaning the entire lung comes out. You may be saying that how can someone breathe after having a whole lung taken out? Surprisingly, the human being is redundant. The two lungs are separated. Many people are walking around in the world with one lung completely out and leaving, living a very normal life. I'll answer that question at the very end, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to give you a schematic. Uh, there are tumors that come from, in this example, of a left upper lobe tumor. Classically, it is very difficult to, to just say, cut this out, the left main stem, thus taking out the left pneumonectomy. But the surgeons with very good skill set nowadays can do what's called sleeve resection if anatomically allowed. What they do is that they can actually isolate the main branch of the main stem, isolate the 
lower branch and leads in the lower and reattach. And that's called a sleeve resection. So now having given Dr. Berry the pluck, I will go back to a bronchoscopy approach. About 10% of carcinoid tumor turns out to just present as a lung nodule. It is uncommon, but it is still uh, encountered. Uh, this is one example of a very small lung nodule in the left low lobe. This is a CAT scan, the right, the left, there's a liver, and this is a diaphragm. This nodule is five millimeter, it's right about the diaphragm. So we heard a little bit about a integrated multidisciplinary approach. For a surgeon, it is actually very difficult to be able to feel this lymph node across the, across the lung, uh, either by visualization or palpation or trying to touch it. So what we do at Stanford now is that um, we combine the interventional pulmonologist and the surgeon together. What we do is that the thoracic surgeon can give us a virtual image of the tree based on that patient's CAT scan, and we create a 3D map in some way, a GPS system as like your car, and the computer system would tell us where to go in terms of that path. So in this lesion itself, the left lower lobe, it's giving us something from point A, which is a trachea, all the way down to the left lower lobe itself. And that would be the path in terms of the representation of the different cuts of the lung. And we borrow uh, the strategy from the radiolog uh, uh, cardiologist where they can put a stent in the heart and we use the same way to basically place different biopsy tools or, or instrumentation all the way down via this channel. Uh, this is, uh, I hope that Stanford will give me a bigger space in the future, but this is our room. It's got a lot of instrumentations. It's not intimidating at all. But what we do is that um, the computer system basically will allow us to use a navigational system when it was leading us to the tumor, which is the green dot, that we can make biopsies. More importantly, um, we can actually inject dye markers at that point, and the patient can immediately be in the operating room, and the patient, patient undergoes a VATS. They can go in, and there's a blue dye that we tattoo. So they can actually go for the tattoo marker, and there's a very high correlation and success rate. Um, okay, so the last portion of this is really about what we do when we do not resect someone um, complete uh, surgery, but rather just a bronchoscopic approach. Well, bronchoscopy is simple, um, meaning that if we need to destroy tumor within the airway itself, we either use heat or we use cold. So uh, this is a system that we use uh, that uh, Dr. Fisser, I'm sure, also uses uh, in the liver. Uh, we use argon plasma. It is not a laser. All it is is a heat energy system that basically gives us a, um, a gas that gets attracted to the tumor itself, and it can actually give us a very precise colorization and destruction of the tumor along with blood vessels. Uh, this was actually a video, but I forgot to integrate it, so I don't think this, oh wait, actually it will come up. Wow. So this is uh, basically a, a colorization system that you don't actually have to touch the tumor, is a non-contact way for how we use heat to ablate the tumor. Let's see if I get lucky and get this too. On the opposite spectrum, sometimes we don't want to use heat. Um, we use cold energy. And this is something that you may come across sometimes Googling, um, using cold and basically using extreme cold, a liquid nitrogen that's contacted to the probe itself and it would cause a ice cube. And what you can do is that you make contact with the tumor and slowly take out the tumor that may be obstructing. Having said that, bronchoscopic or camera approach of taking out the tumor is still not center of care. Meaning that if we can make the patient feel better, meaning that opening up the airway, whereas they need to get adjuvant chemotherapy as such, and if that is approach, we we'll certainly be happy to do so. But again, for a tumor that arises from the lung primarily, surgical resection and a clean resection is still the center of care. So in summary, bronchial carcinoid can commonly involve the lung, 
central airway is more the common site, so therefore, a pulmonologist that uses bronchoscopy, it's a really good way to get uh, tissue biopsy. Uh, surgical cure is the goal, and there are many diff different techniques for, for us now in terms of how to stage lung cancer and to treat some of the local symptoms related to carcinoid tumor. So with that said, thank you very much. So, um, so great, thank you, Dr. Sunk. So um, maybe time for one question, one or two questions while well, Dr. Bergsland rushed here from SFO to, to the conference, so she's made it. We'll get her slides loaded and maybe have time for one or two questions. You thank you, great presentation. If you have a um, hyalur, uh, uh, or rather a mediastinal mass with yep. a lot of hyalur adenopathy, then you don't do you try to attempt to resect, or do you just go straight away to ablation? Or uh, No, very good question. Um, I think that either what I show you with the ultrasound bronchoscope, or what a surgeon does in terms of what's called mesinoscopy, I do think lymph nodes in the middle central portion should be completely sampled to make sure that whether those are truly involvement of cancer cells or not. So I don't think just having a highly involvement itself should exclude someone from having surgery, especially now we have sleep resection techniques. Thank you. One more. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you. Sure. <laughs> so. Emily Bergsland probably needs no introduction, but she's a, um, a good friend and a colleague at UCSF. She's a medical oncologist with a special interest in um, GI medical oncology, but in neuroendocrine tumors, we um, share many patients and are on a number of committees together. But Emily's going to speak about advances in medical oncology. Okay, a couple of things um, as we get started. Number one, um, I just wanted to thank Pam and George and the Caring for Carcinoid Foundation for including me today. It's really a pleasure to be here. The second thing, is I just want to apologize in advance if any of this is redundant. Um, as Pam just said, I just came here um, having landed at about 1 o'clock today. So I didn't see the other talks this morning, and if there's anything that's duplicative, I apologize. Um, I'm going to give you sort of the 30,000 foot view of everything that's been going on in neuroendocrine tumors with an emphasis on ongoing trials that I think might be of interest. Um, and just trying to hopefully put it all in perspective and importantly leave you with some of the unanswered questions because while there have been a lot of advances, there are still a number of things that are not yet answered, uh, which I think are critical to all of you here in the room, uh, but we're making progress and hopefully I'll convince you of that today. So, um, with that in mind, um, I'm going to be focused purely, um, almost exclusively, on, on what's traditionally been termed carcinoids or well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors that are arising outside of the pancreas. Um, I'm not going to focus at all on a, a rare subtype of tumor called paraganglioma or pheochromocytoma, and I'm also not going to talk too much about high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. And again, I apologize um, if there are those of you in the room uh, with those diseases, but just due to the sake of time, I'll be focusing more on the, the traditionally and more commonly seen tumors, um, carcinoid and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So um, one of the very important things that we're faced with when we decide about treatment is thinking about why we're going to start therapy. And I want to just stress there are really two reasons why one might start therapy. Uh, one happens to be if somebody has symptoms related to their, their tumor, and many of these tumors make hormones which can cause clinical syndromes, and those are called functional tumors. Um, in other cases, there are no hormones made or hormones are made that don't actually cause any symptoms, and those are called non-functional tumors. The other reason we might initiate therapy is if there's actual evidence for tumor progression or there are symptoms from the bulk of the tumor itself. So there are going to be a number of patients, and I would say increasingly so, who are identified when they're asymptomatic, sometimes incidentally discovered on a CT scan done for another reason. And those are patients in whom we might actually consider a watch and wait approach. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the first thing I think many of us do is we sort of look at it like this algorithm here is what's the reason for therapy? Uh, so just focusing 
On the symptom control, I just want to mention a couple of different strategies that are out there. The main one is um, the use of somatostatin analogs, and I think these will be familiar with, um, to many of you in the room. Um, somatostatin is a hormone that all of us have and, and make on a regular basis in our bodies. There are analogs of, of somatostatin that are available. The, the, one that are, the ones that are used uh, commonly are octreotide and more recently lanreotide. Um, but these agents actually have both been studied for symptom control, and in fact, both of them do have activity in terms of controlling symptom. It's actually the reason that octreotide is approved in the United States. Lenreotide is approved for symptom control in Europe. But both of them actually have data. They bind the um, somatostatin receptors. There are actually five of them. These bind receptors two and five with high affinity, and they're actually proven to uh, reduce symptoms related to hormones. Now what we don't know, and I'll just nip this one in the bud because this will come up now that lenreotide is approved in the United States, we actually really don't know yet the value, if there is any at all, of using lenreotide after previously being treated with octreotide or failing octreotide or um, vice versa. Um, the role of high dose therapy beyond the FDA approved dose is really hasn't been definitively been proven um, and that remains a study question. There is a study actually ongoing that John Strasberg is leading looking at high-dose octreotide at a, at a dose of 60 milligrams a month. But again, this is really a research question and one that hasn't um, been shown to be a proven benefit. And then similarly for lenreotide, which is a newer drug in terms of our, our armamentarium in the United States, lenreotide's approved dose is 120 milligrams per month. Um, it actually was approved for tumor control, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but again, if people are on it and happen to be experiencing symptom relief, we don't know the value for higher doses um, than the approved dose. So I also wanted to briefly mention there are some other strategies out there in addition to developing new somatostatin analogs. Um, there is a drug out there called telotrostat, which is designed to actually inhibit the production of serotonin. Serotonin is produced uh, from tryptophan in a multi-step process, the first of which is mediated by an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase. And this is an inhibitor of tryptophan hydroxylase, and obviously one might expect that you would get um, reduced levels of serotonin. In the urine, we measure something called 5-HIA, and many of you in the room may be familiar with that collection. You can also measure it in the plasma. So this is now being studied, studied again for symptom control, not for um, control of tumor growth. Uh, this is a phase three study, the um, TILA star study, which is ongoing right now, looking at reducing the number of um, bowel movements in patients who have refractory diarrhea. And I would mention there actually is a parallel study that I actually think is open at Stanford. You guys are still accruing to that. That is for patients with symptoms that, um, uh, that are not eligible for this trial, which specifically looks for um, a certain number of diarrhea uh, bowel movements a day for eligibility. But this is a phase three study. I think it's very exciting. It's something novel, and I think for people who have uh, refractory symptoms, this could be very helpful. Again, this is targeted really to people with the traditional carcinoids and elevated serotonin. So I now want to turn um, for the remainder of my talk and focus on treatments of the tumor itself, so things that slow or reverse or um, delay tumor growth. Um, not, now you may along the way hopefully develop, um, if you have benefit from these therapies, hopefully you'll also have benefits in terms of symptom control, but these are things that have been developed and tested due to their abilities to reduce the growth of the tumor. Um, again, patient selection is really important, and I think not everybody needs the same um, sequence of therapies or the same types of therapies, and this is something that's a real challenge in a field where there's so much heterogeneity in terms of patient symptoms and biology of the underlying tumor. So I'm going to briefly run through these, um, the agents that are the strategies that are listed here, um, and uh, hopefully bring you up to date on what's known and what's unknown in terms of these um, therapies. So in terms of somatostatin analogs, I mentioned that these have have definite activity in terms of controlling symptoms, and it's actually the reason that octreotide is, is approved in the United States. However, it's been known um, for quite a while, in fact, now proven, that these agents also slow tumor growth. Um, it's very uncommon for these agents to actually shrink tumors. 
Um, but patients do appear to experience, in many cases, a delay in the tumor growth. So there was a study nicknamed the PROMID study that was published a few years ago using octreotide, the long-acting version, LAR. Um, and this was shown to delay tumor growth in patients specifically with mid-gut tumors. Uh, and again, the way these patients were enrolled and the way the growth was measured in this study, the patients on placebo uh, showed evidence for tumor growth on average at six months, whereas the patients that, who were treated with octreotide showed evidence for tumor growth at 14 months. So it was a definite statistically significant uh, delay in tumor growth. Again, shrinkage is rare with this type of strategy. More recently, the results of the clarinet study became available. Now, the clarinet study was actually done in lanreotide, uh, using lanreotide. It was predominantly done in patients with non-functional tumors, so patients who didn't have symptoms from hormone overproduction. It included mid-gut tumors as well as patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And again, um, you'll see that there was a delay in tumor growth. Now, this study was done in a different way in terms of the eligibility. They ended up enrolling probably patients with much more stable disease, just the way the eligibility were designed in this study. And you'll notice that the patients even receiving placebo did not show evidence for tumor growth for, on average, about 16 months. And then for the patients receiving the lanreotide, we haven't yet reached their, their median time to progression. So somewhat different patient population, the way this trial was designed, but the same outcome in the sense there was a delay in tumor growth. Um, for both of these agents, serious side effects are actually really rare. And while there certainly are patients who are intolerant or have trouble with somatostatin analogs, in terms of the agents that we have, these are actually really very well tolerated relative to some of the other things that we use. Um, again, when people have symptoms, sometimes people will have diarrhea or bloating or cramping. Some people will have um, uh, gallbladder, uh, gall gallbladder um, sludging or stones as well with these agents. Um, because of these data with lanreotide showing a delay in tumor growth, this led actually to the approval of this agent in the United States in December. So this agent is now available for use uh, in our patients. Now, in terms of tumor control, again, a common question that comes up is which one's better? And we really don't know. Again, these trials were designed in different ways in somewhat different patient populations. And so um, it's difficult to give you a firm answer on which of these is a better agent. Um, in terms of the timing of therapy, again, we tend to struggle with this question. Many times when patients are diagnosed, I think there's a uh, a feeling of wanting to get started on therapy, um, often on behalf of the physician as well as the patient, but it may not be necessary in all patients to initiate therapy right away because this is a very indolent disease by and large when patients have well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Um, there are some other um, uh, organ sites that are less represented by and large in these studies, and I would say rectal tumors and lung tumors tend to be often underrepresented, so I would say it's just harder to give firm data in those, pa in those patient populations, although there are subgroups, uh, particularly in the, um, that are, that are, have been at least included in some of these studies, particularly in the lanreotide trial. Um, and as I said, the optimal somatostatin analog, I think that's difficult to to identify based on the data we have right now. But what's nice to know is we have data that both agents, at least in these separate trials, do have activity in terms of delaying the growth of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Now, I would like to mention that there's been um, a lot of interest in developing second generation or third generation somatostatin analogs. One of them that's out there is a drug called pasreotide. Um, this actually binds four receptors with pretty good um, uh, affinity. Remember I said there are five um, somatostatin receptors. Um, but it was looked at in a study that looked at, at um, symptom control, and actually that study was a negative, uh, negative study in terms of uh, superiority over octreotide. However, in that study, as a secondary endpoint, they looked at time to tumor growth, and it looked like there was a hint that pasreotide may in fact delay progression perhaps not surprisingly, given its mechanism of action. Um, there is a study, a small study ongoing right now looking at anti-tumor activity with passereotide, but it's not yet available for this indication. And, and again, the, the ultimate value of it hasn't been determined. <clears throat> 
Next, I want to turn to uh, something that is not readily available in the United States, but is used elsewhere in the world called peptide receptor radiotherapy. Now, the idea behind this, for those of you who don't know, is to link a radio tracer with the somatostatin analog as a way of delivering radiation to patients. Um, of course, this hinges on the tumors being positive on a Nectria scan or similar type study. Uh, but in patients with positive uptake, one could imagine this might be a way that you could deliver radiation. There are a couple of different tracers that are used, the most common ones are lutetium-177 or yttrium-90. Um, there have been a number of studies done, again, mostly outside the United States and non-randomized, suggesting some benefit in patients. Um, but really, uh, what's desperately needed are randomized trials, and I think that's really limited um, the availability of this agent, certainly in the United States. Uh, there is a trial going on right now the Netter-1 study, which is specifically in patients with mid-gut tumors, and it randomizes patients to receive PRT versus high-dose octreotide uh, when they are uh, refractory to standard-dose octreotide. Now, interestingly, I'm not going to go over these in detail, but I just wanted to point out the good news is there's actually a number of studies now that are ongoing with peptide receptor radiotherapy, and a couple of these, in fact, are randomized, uh, are additional randomized studies, and so I think there's a lot of hope that in the coming years, we're going to get quite a bit more information about the value of peptide receptor radiotherapy, um, including um, from a few trials that are randomized. Um, I want to just briefly mention interferon. This is not a widely used agent uh, anymore, although we did use it before we had some of the, the newer therapies. But I did just want to mention there are some limited data suggesting that interferon actually has some activity in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, it's fairly limited in the sense that major shrinkage is quite rare. Um, it does have some toxicity, and I think that's what's limited the interest in, in developing and using interferon. Um, and again, it's not widely available or not widely used in the United States, but I just wanted you guys to know about it as it, it certainly has historical significance and um, may in fact have some limited activity in this population. Uh, a brief mention of chemotherapy. Um, a lot of interest in chemotherapy and trying to identify agents that are active. Uh, not surprisingly, tumors that are rapidly dividing and have a high proliferative rate might be more sensitive to chemotherapy. And in fact, that is traditionally what's been seen. Uh, tumors that are high-grade tumors, G3 tumors, are in fact sensitive to chemotherapy, and that in fact is our standard first-line treatment. There are some caveats because there actually are different subtypes of high-grade tumors, small cell as well as large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas. And then there's a big spectrum within high-grade neuroendocrine tumors because, as some of you may know, we include tumors with a proliferation rate over 20% and anything up to 100%. So there's a really big spectrum. But nevertheless, the traditional treatment for those patients is, in fact, chemotherapy, usually with um, platinum-containing regimens. Now, in contrast, the role of chemotherapy in well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors is much less clear. And it really remains so. There have been many studies done over the years with chemotherapy. Remember, these tumors are often not very proliferative. In some, case, some cases, less than 2% of the cells may be dividing. So it's perhaps not surprising that they may not be incredibly sensitive to, to traditional chemotherapy regimens. I would say pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors seem to be a bit more sensitive to chemotherapy. And I think that many of us have had a lower threshold for trying chemotherapy. Uh, the traditional regimen, and in fact, one that's approved, is streptozosin-based chemotherapy. However, that's a relatively toxic um, type of chemotherapy, although there are a number of ways to deliver it. It does have activity, but if you look at the clinical trials done with streptozosin, they've been sort of inconsistent in terms of the actual amount of efficacy in this population, which has led to a lot of interest in developing new agents and new regimens. The one that surfaced sort of at the top of the list these days is temozolomide-based therapy. I would say there's some very intriguing data that have come out, including one study suggesting a response rate as high as 
but I would just caution everyone that that was done in something called a retrospective fashion, which means sort of retrospectively going over your patient charts and looking to see how patients did. And what we really need in the field are prospective randomized studies. And luckily, in fact, there is one that's available right now that's ongoing, that's accruing. Dr. Coons is actually the national PI on this study. And it's asking an important question. Number one, the activity of, the, of temozolomide-based therapy in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients, but also what's the optimal regimen looking at a two-drug versus one-drug regimen. Uh, there really isn't a standard regimen in, in patients with traditional carcinoid tumors. Um, and I would say it's used on a very case-by-case uh, -case basis. Um, I'd like to turn now and talk about some of the biologic agents. So these are targeted agents, uh, the first one being something called VEGF inhibitors. So, um, wow, this is, this is white on my screen, not yellow, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, the bottom line is, what's VEGF? Well, that's vascular endothelial growth factor. And this is probably the most potent direct-acting regulator of blood vessel growth in our bodies. All of us have it. it. It is certainly very important for both physiologic as well as pathologic blood vessel growth. And it turns out that neuroendocrine tumors are highly vascular and we think are very dependent on growth factors like VEGF. And so this has spawned a very large effort to develop inhibitors of VEGF. Some are IV, such as the antibodies, and the antibodies in some cases target the actual factor circulating in the blood, or in other cases they target the receptor for VEGF. And then in addition, there are a variety of agents out there that have been developed to inhibit the receptor signaling. Those tend to be oral agents, so pills, um, and many of these been, have been developed have been, and have been approved in other disease indications. Not surprisingly, things have lagged a bit behind in neuroendocrine tumors, although there is one approved agent, and I'll show you that, those data right now. So again, the idea is not so much to target the tumor itself, um, but to target the blood vessel growth that feeds the tumor is the theory behind this. Um, so there has been a phase, phase three study done in patients with progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors with an oral small molecule inhibitor called sunitinib. And what you can see is actually sunitinib delayed tumor growth. Patients receiving placebo had a median time to progression of 5.5 months. And the patients receiving sunitinib, it was 11 months. And this led to FDA approval of this agent in 2011. Um, the, I should point out the shrinkage rate with this drug is pretty low, um, it, in under 10% in this study. Now, there's only been one phase three study reported out yet in carcinoid tumors, uh, and actually we haven't even seen the data from this, um, but there was a in, sort of um, early results released um, to patients and their physicians um, earlier this year suggesting that this trial is a negative study with bevacizumab, um, and um, versus interferon in patients with carcinoid. Now, remember I said interferon actually has activity, we think, or may have activity, and that might have confounded our ability to um, interpret these data, but we haven't yet seen the formal uh, release of this information. Um, now, in terms of... Um, other studies that are ongoing, there is a trial ongoing right now with pazopinib, which is another small molecule inhibitor, and this is with um, in patients with progressive carcinoid tumors receiving pazopinib versus placebo. Um, this is ongoing and available. Um, actually, I think at both our institutions, right, um, in terms of the Bay Area. Um, and then there are a number of other studies that are ongoing. So there still is a, quite a bit of interest in, in uh, VEGF inhibitors. Again, a variety of agents are under study. A couple of randomized trials are available in Europe, um, as well as, in, as I mentioned, the United States. Next, I want to just um, turn to the mTOR inhibitors. Um, mTOR pathway inhibitors actually target mTOR signaling in the tumor cells. We know from um, some studies on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and also in the patient groups who are at risk for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that the mTOR pathway seems to be important in terms of tumor growth um, and is an attractive target. And in fact, there are drugs that are available that inhibit mTOR. There's actually been a phase three study already done um, with a drug called Everolimus, which is a pill mTOR inhibitor. 
um, in patients with progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And what you'll see actually in this study, again a phase three study, was there was also a delay in tumor growth in this study um, from about 4.6 months in patients receiving placebo to 11 months in patients receiving Everolimus. Now, if you put these, um, sort of to put them in perspective, as I mentioned, sunitinib is a VEGF inhibitor that's approved. Everolimus was approved at the very same time, also in 2011. If you look at them side by side, they actually have pretty similar activity. Neither of these drugs causes major shrinkage by and large, but both of them appear to delay growth in patients with progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, they have different side effect profiles, and I've listed the common side effects here. And what you'll see is that um, this means that it leads to a dilemma. We actually don't know if there's one that's preferred over the other in terms of using these. So we tend to um, go look at the patient, their um, other medical problems that they might have, their preference, the doctor preference, to decide how to sequence these agents. But it's an unanswered question whether one versus the other should be used in a given patient. Um, there is a lot of interest in wondering, well, what if you combine these two strategies? And again, this is an unanswered question. I'll just show you some data that were recently published um, very, just in the last few weeks using an IV version of an mTOR inhibitor called Temsorolimus plus um, a VEGF antibody, Bevacizumab. And one thing that's interested is I'll just point out that the shrinkage rate in this study was over 40%. And I'll just mention that's very interesting because I said to you that typically these drugs don't cause by themselves major shrinkage. So it's leading to some interest in whether we actually might find some creative ways by combining some agents uh, in order to, to actually see shrinkage, which is certainly very valuable in some patients. So uh, there is a randomized study that has been done, the results of which are not available yet and hopefully will be coming out relatively soon. This was a study looking at Everolimus with or without Bevacizumab, again an antibody to the VEGF ligand, um, and again the results are not available yet. But a lot of interest of course in seeing the data from this. Um, in terms of the traditional carcinoid tumors, um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, we don't yet have any approved VEGF inhibitor agents, and we don't have mTOR inhibitor agents approved. Uh, there is a study called Radiant 4, which has been completed. The results are not yet available, and this was done in patients with progressive, advanced, non-functional neuroendocrine tumors, and again, we await the results, which will hopefully be available relatively soon. Um, there, are, there is one other study I just wanted to mention for the people who might have lung or thymus tumors, which again fall in this sort of underrepresented category of neuroendocrine tumor. And this was a randomized study looking at passoreotide or avrolimus or both. And again, the results are not available. So I'd like to just finish by saying that there have been major advances in the last few years. Um, certainly in my professional career, lots of, lo quite a bit has changed, not the least of which is we no longer bundle carcinoids with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I think we recognize that well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors arising in the pancreas are probably different than those arising elsewhere, genetically and potentially biologically. Um, whether the other subtypes, again, rectal or thymus, bronchial, differ from midgut mid is an unanswered question right now. They, they are often bundled in clinical trials. And the therapy of an individual patient really needs to be looked at in terms of weighing the pros and cons for that person. Um, many of these therapies have side effects, and we have to really weigh at what point do you institute therapy. I would say, by and large, there's still the belief that in some patients, a watch and wait approach is very reasonable. Um, we now have good data that somatostatin analogs do, in fact, have antiproliferative activity. Um, again, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we now have two targeted agents that are available. Um, they stabilize rather than shrink in most patients, and the optimal sequence of those agents is uncertain. The role of chemotherapy is evolving, and luckily there are some ongoing trials looking at this. Um, and then we don't yet have good biomarkers to drive therapy, and I think there's a lot of interest in this, um, but we haven't yet reached a point where we're actually testing the tumor for a specific biomarker, nor do we have data that bi that biomarker will predict who might respond to a given therapy, but hopefully that's coming down the pipeline. So finally, I'll just leave you with the questions that um, may lead into the, the, the question and answer center later on, but 
Uh, again, we struggle with knowing in which patients should we use therapy and in which things should we use first line. You've heard about surgery. Uh, we've talked about liver-directed therapy. Um, and then certainly I've talked about the systemic therapies in my talk. Um, the role of combination therapies continues to be evolving and certainly is not standard at this point. And then finally, I'll just mention one of the things that comes up a lot after surgery is, is there anything else I should be doing after my, my tumor's been completely resected? And I would say at this point, there, are, there is nothing standard. However, there is an ongoing trial looking at the use of everolimus versus placebo in patients who have had resected liver metastases from pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. That study is open to accrual now for those of you for whom that might be relevant. So with that, I will finish up, and I thank you very much for your attention.